Can, can you expand a little bit on the low-level nav piece? Um, I had a guy called Nick Forster on the channel. He, he flew Tornado GR4s and GR1s, and he talked a lot about yeah. low-level nav um, and flying the Hawk out of Valley uh, and mm -hmm. uh, Chivener, um in, in, in terms of sort of how they did it. I'd never heard anybody talk about tracking the route with their thumb. That's a new thing <laughs> for me. How, how did uh, it, sounds, uh, it sounds obvious, but how did that, how did that work then? You know, so, sometimes you'd have quite a large map, you know, because we covered a lot of ground at, at 420 knots. So you'd have quite a large map, you know, which wasn't necessarily straight out and straight back. It would go out in a big circle. So we would, we would cut the map into strips and then we would glue these strips together in a straight line. And then you would either, typically we wouldn't roll it up, we would fold it up into manageable size pieces. So it would be maybe, you know, five or six inches wide. And um, you would have to track where you were over the ground based on your time and your, and your heading uh, and based on ground features. So typically in order to, to keep track of where you should be on the map, you would sort of pull the map down with your thumb. Yeah. Uh. And that's how he found the piece that was glued to us. <laughs> okay. And so, yeah. so that, what sort of scale was the map? Sorry, I'm, I'm asking a really nerdy question. Because but but, but no, no, I'm thinking about lateral deviation. A, I'm thinking if you get bounced and you go left or right yeah. of the line, how far oh, do you yeah. have to go before you're off the map? <laughs> yeah, it was a nightmare. Yeah, I mean, it was all, it's all very good when you're flying on the line, on speed, on heading. But it's like you say, when you get bounced or you have to go around weather or whatever, then it starts to get real hard work. So um, we because of the detail we needed, we actually flew with uh, one to 250,000 scale maps. You know, typically wow. uh, VFR charts are one to 500,000, yeah. but we flew with the uh, one to 250 and you, and you had good detail on, on the terrain features on those, but it made very big maps. I think. So, yeah. you know, it was a, it was an exercise in uh, administrative management in the cockpit to, to try and not obscure your whole vision with this map. <laughs> I, I hate to admit it, but you know, like some people I knew got, very very far off the track and had no idea where they ended up <laughs> what would you do if that happened just pop up and call air traffic or, or get attack and reading because you were higher no so that was you know the, the first tour i said i did in bagotville and and we would typically go from late october to probably late march without having a ceiling above uh a thousand feet Right. So it was just, it was that part of the world where there was a lot of moisture in the air and, and it was always low level clouds. So we would roar around, you know, and, and we were cleared down to a hundred feet then at 420 knots. So we would be roaring around at a hundred feet. And like you said, if we got bounced or, or we had to deviate around a low cloud and weather and stuff, then you're off track. And now you're trying to get back on track to something that you can recognize. And if you don't recognize it, now you're in big trouble because you're not going to get an attack in or any that kind of stuff. Mm. So um you could you could pop up above cloud and you know talk back to base but you know even then your radios are probably only going to work for about 100 uh, nautical miles so you really had to figure it out you had to figure out how to get back to something that you recognized and there were some big features out there but you know uh, sometimes it would that would get the pucker factor up for a while yeah what, what about um, the terrain then? So you talked about how you sort of did your initial training in the flatlands and then you start, moved to more interesting terrain in, in sort of central, um, do you say Quebec? Is it Quebec? Yes. Yeah, yeah. central Quebec. Yes, um, yeah. What, what um, and I'm, I'm, I'm interested to hear you say that those two instructors in the, in the 104 went and hit a lake, a frozen lake, and you said that's always the way it is. Uh, are there sort yeah. of visual deceptions associated with flying over snow in the same way as there are flying oh, yeah. over, over the sea? Um, what what were the sort of visual Similar, yeah. and, and actual sort of yeah. physiological challenges behind flying low in, in those in that over that terrain? Yeah, so the, uh, this this has happened a few times, and, and a good friend of mine was killed the same way too. Uh, it was he was flying over a frozen lake, and um, it can even be uh, you know quite good weather. Um, so people talk about whiteout. Um, whiteout is when you lose your horizon. But when you fly over a large frozen lake, you still have a horizon. But the problem is that the shoreline, you can um, confuse that with the horizon. So they, you know, you'll now set your flight vector on the shoreline instead of the horizon, which means you're descending. So that's one of the possibilities. The other thing is, like flying over the ocean, um, you lose your 
you lose your perspective, especially in high G turns. Mm -hmm. And you, you know, you just can't you can't visually gauge how high above the the surface that you are. Uh, the rad alt works up to about seventy degrees of bank, but if you're beyond seventy degrees, it's not to, it's not measuring an altitude either. So, and you know, it's like I said, when when you're at a hundred feet and you're going those speeds, uh, if you're not watching what you're doing, then two seconds later you're going to get to the you know into the lake. Mm. Yeah. It's is uh, I noticed your aircraft in the picture that that we popped up um, a green. Um, and obviously over a sort of foresty terrain where it's not snowy, I guess that makes them difficult to pick up. But but was it snowy right. a lot and, and and therefore was it easier to maintain a sort of um, a visual formation because of the colour? I'm curious to know whether or not green's a good colour. With the RAF, for example, when they went to Norway, um, when they had green painted aeroplanes, they would paint them green and white. They would put this sort of temporary whitewash type thing on them, wouldn't they? And I, I, I'm right. sort of curious to know whether or not you did the same and, and the effectiveness of the camouflage scheme that you had on those F5s. Yeah, that, and um, I'll tell you a great story uh, in a couple of minutes here. But um, so there's no perfect camouflage, and and I, the general consensus, as you can see now, in all air forces, is a neutral gray. So you're absolutely right. If you're flying over a frozen lake or frozen terrain in a dark green airplane, then you're going to stick out like dog's bollocks. Um, on the flip side, if you're flying a light airplane over the dark forest, you're going to stick out as well. So. Um, when I was flying the F5, we also used to do a red flag every year, which is great fun. You know, you're, you're, uh, it's down in Las Vegas. So we would stay in the city in a hotel in the city. And then we'd fly these missions, you know, at a Nellis Air Force Base. And uh, I think it was maybe the second time I've been there. Um, we deployed down there from Bagotville and we spent the night in um, Williams Air Force Base in, in uh, Phoenix in Arizona. And then we flew from Phoenix up to las vegas which is a fairly short hop so the guy that was leading our formation of four he he'd been on exchange down in um, in the states at williams so he knew the terrain and he goes okay he says we're going to fly up the grand canyon um but he says you cannot go below the lip of the canyon he said it's huge it's not a safety issue but it's highly monitored and they've had a couple of mid-air collisions in there so do not do that whatever you do so we go okay yeah, yeah that makes sense so we um we did that a spectacular trip we land in uh, nellis and then um, a squadron of French Jaguars came in after us. And when they landed, there was a big greeting committee. So the base commander was there and a bunch of military policemen and stuff. We thought, oh, well, you know, I guess we don't rate that in terms of international uh, welcome, but yeah, good for the French, you know. So we find out later that the French had flown into the canyon with their whole squadron of Jaguars, pissed off everybody, and they were getting a bollocking from the base commander when they landed. <laughs> So getting back to the camouflage, they decided, you know, because they, they'd operated in North Africa and all that kind of stuff. So they thought they were going to paint their dark green jags with this, you know, hodgepodge uh, um, desert colored camouflage. So the ground crew were out there and they did quite a nice job, actually. Like, they, you know, we would typically just slop the paint on if we were going to do that. But they, they actually, you know, followed the contours of the green and painted over this desert camouflage. But it came out yellow. <laughs> and it was you know back then this was in the early 80s so most of the um air-to-air -air shots were were visual uh heater shots we call you know the infrared missiles and then you would call that out on the uh on the common frequency and said you know uh f4 over such and such uh you know fox 2 kill type of thing but whenever it was the french jag it would always be Fox two kill on the yellow jag over this mountain, <laughs> and you'd hear that over and over and over on the frequency, and it's like, oh man, you poor guys. <laughs> so sometimes they screw it up, yeah. And um, we we would do they would take us out for a day if you wanted to to do a desert survival out in uh, in Nellis, and back then we had uh, tan flying suits or we had dark dark green flying suits. Those are the two. Uh, choices that we had um so a buddy of mine goes up to do this one day uh, survival exercise and he took his tan flying suit thinking that would be the best um camouflage for him so he he finished at the end of the day and they had a debriefing and the the staff that was doing the exercise said uh, hey canadian and he said did you realize how visible you were out there and he goes 
Yeah, he says, I couldn't really find a lot of sand to hide in. So, of course, all the rock out there is dark, dark brown or even black rock. And that's where you're going to be hiding. You're not going to be out in the middle of the of the sand dunes, right? So he goes, yeah, he said, you stuck out like a sore thumb. Yeah. Wow. So camouflage is, is difficult. Yeah. Yeah. It's a hard one to hard one to call.